I am here with Lisa Perks. Lisa, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, John. Thank you so much for having me. So we have reconnected after a number of years, and we have something in common where we have had to deal with vocal crisis and vocal shame. And you are currently working on your PhD. You are going to do a thesis on uh, the voice and shame. Uh, catch us up to date. What is your journey through this up until today? Okay, so I'll give you a little bit of a background, um, just a, a very bare bones of it. So um, I started to get a wobble in my voice when I was working professionally as a vocalist in my late twenties. Um, at that point, I'd been working professionally for about 15 years. So I was a child performer right up through my twenties. And this wobble appeared. And at the time I had no idea what to do with it. Um, I was teaching at a university. I'd graduated. I was doing an album. I was touring. It was, it was actually a really good time for me professionally. Um, but this wobble kicked in and it just threw me. Um, I had a particularly difficult experience in a very uh, big jazz competition. I shan't mention it precisely, but uh, at the end of it, uh, I had a massive shame moment. Uh, I only look back on it now and I go, oh, OK, that's where that's not where it began, but it's certainly where if I look back retrospectively, I can identify it as a shame moment. Um, but I, as I said, I, I won't go too far into that because it's kind of, it's part of the story, but it's not necessarily the whole story. So once I discovered that there was this wobble, I started out finding different teachers and I ended up working with an SLS teacher back in the UK and she was lovely. And that led me over to LA and San Francisco to work with other teachers um, in SLS. And then I became an SLS teacher. And during that time, I was looking for the answer to this wobble. And it never really went away. And so even though I was working on my voice, doing what you're supposed to do, the, bo the wobble never went. <clears throat> and so bit by bit, I just decided I wasn't good enough. I was going to keep pulling back from performing, which I did. Um, and then a great opportunity came up for me and my husband and we moved to Australia. So I moved to Australia, gave up my job at the university, gave up all of my gigs, stopped doing the thing that I loved and decided that I would be a really good teacher. And I would set up a business over here and network and do all the things, which I did. I did everything I said I was going to do. However, underneath it all was this wobble and this progressive sense of this is awful. And I remember coming to a point where I would almost swear at my voice. You know, I would swear at myself. I would swear at my voice. I hated it. I hated every sound that was coming out. I was... Uh, micromanaging, uh, doubting. So this became like a pathological problem in the end. Um, anyway, I had some great teachers, wonderful experiences with the team, including yourself, John. Um, but I, I reached a crisis point just after I met you and I went and uh, had yet another scope because I'd been scoped many times and they'd said there was nothing pathological going on. And then I went, I got scoped and they said, oh, there's a polyp. I was like, oh, OK. Right. So what can I do about it was my reaction. What can I do about this? They said, well, you can have surgery, but why don't you just continue working on your voice? OK. So went off, continued working on my voice. And then um, I'm just trying to think what happened after that. So carried on working actually had some improvement. I don't know, it was almost like the diagnosis made me kind of pull up my pants a little bit and, you know, okay, I can deal with this. I've got great teachers. I know lots of people. I'll carry on. 
So carried on, had a bit more success, was not quite as caught up in my own head around my voice. And then like out of the blue, I thought, oh, maybe, maybe I could go back and sing again because I missed it. And I had a word with a good friend and colleague and he said, well, yeah. And I said, well, I think I'm going to have to have the operation before I do this because it's like I'm running with a stone in my shoe or something. So I went and had the operation. And then at the end of that operation to remove said polyp, I woke up and the surgeon who I knew said, actually, it's good news, Lisa. It was just a um, it was a nodule. It actually wasn't a polyp and it was just on one side. I was like, OK. So that was it. Had the operation, did the recovery, came out of recovery and I thought, no, this isn't right. Like this is just, it's not, it's not good. And then I just became paranoid because I was like, oh my God, I've had this operation and geez, this must be better. So went back to the surgery and said, hey, I don't know, like this doesn't feel right. I've worked with singers with injury. I know my voice. This does not feel good. The person said to me, well, actually, I think you're probably, it's, it's probably okay. Like you, you, you should be okay. Okay. So I went away. They actually told me to go and have a good sing. Maybe just let it out. So I did. Went back two weeks later or whatever it was, three weeks later. Said, no, not happy. They scoped. And sure enough, there was some scar tissue damage. So, oh, okay. So then I blamed myself because I thought, well, scar tissue damage, you know, that's because of you. That's you. That's your fault. So I asked if there was anything that could be done. They said, there's a few things. So I think they they thought that maybe um, injecting with, oh gosh, John, help me. Was there going to be Botox? Yeah. Or, or like a, a, a collagen. A, yeah. A co a co like to take down some inflammation. Oh, um, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. What's the word? A, cortisone. A cortisone. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so went in to have that done and possibly the other Botox or whatever. They were, they were just said, we can do a few things. So I said, okay, we'll go back in. We went back in. I woke up from my surgery and the surgeon was quite, <clears throat> quite surprised and quite horrified. He said, actually, there was a cyst very deep which explains why you may have had the uh nodule so you've just been put through the ringer with this oh this this oh like, my goodness this was shit <laughs> yeah so so then i i was just like oh yeah whatever <laughs> and uh I just thought, oh, gosh, this is just awful. This is the worst. And naturally, they had to send the cyst away to look for um, cancer. And, you know, so I spent a good couple of weeks worrying about things like that. Uh, thankfully, it wasn't. So that's good. Um, but ultimately, I ended up with, you know, they removed the cyst. I've got scar tissue damage. And that is the very least of my trouble. Really, it's the psychological damage from 20 years plus of a journey of beginning to notice a demise in the thing that I 100% loved most in my life was singing uh, and naturally born to perform and to do those things, but very, like, a you know, being cut off at a very young point in my career, really. Do you yeah. think if you had gotten the proper diagnosis sooner that psychologically that would have helped you just the the constant thinking okay uh, first you're being told you're healthy and something's not right so you're constantly looking at yourself this is my fault i'm not working my voice right it must be my technique and then there's the scar tissue you think this 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 long drawn out process made things worse 100% um but a bit like you said in your podcast um, around your injury, this is the greatest gift to me in the hardest possible gut punch. It's 
made me come to terms with things like uh, how I over-identified as a performer and as a singer, as a young person, because it meant so much to me. I was wholly identified in there. So I look back now, I mean, I'm going to speak very vulnerably. Um, I grew up with quite a negative sense of my body and my image. I had a sense of being unattractive. So as I matured and became really quite skilled at captivating people by singing and performing, I became attractive. <laughs> you know, it's, and I'm sure that there are people listening that, that may even uh, relate to that as well. There's almost like a, you know, the, the, the what is it? The, the chrysalis, you know, the unfurling of this performer. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Listen, and, I will tell you, I went as a, as a young man, I moved from the drums to the front of the stage. And the reaction that I got was different. Being a singer and being a performer and being vulnerable and c connecting and communicating makes you more attractive. I believe so. Uh, and, and that's what I hung my hat on, you know. And so not only uh, did I lose uh, my instrument or gradually lose the instrument, I also started to lose a significant part of how I felt about myself physically as well. Um, so that is an incredibly difficult thing to come to terms with. Now, what I do want to say, because I do want to touch on shame, throughout that 20-year period up to date, so from whatever it was, 20 years ago to today, I never recognised this connection to shame. So during the course of my adult life, I've had uh, times when I've seen psychologists and done a lot of work on myself emotionally, spiritually over the last, yeah, over the last 20 years. In recent years, probably in the last six years, when I would go and see a psychologist, they would talk to me about the injury. You know, we would talk about identification, um, sorry, self-identity and, and all that stuff. And she, she'd quiz me on the injury and I would say things like, yeah, it was terrible. Yeah, I, I, it really hurt. I, I would come up with these sort of glib uh, ideas around how I felt about it. But afterwards I would leave the session and I'd feel really empty, like I could have gone further, but I didn't really know what to say because the pain was so intense and so deep that only six months ago, seven months ago, I was reading a paper on shame as part of what I'm doing and I realised, oh, my goodness, shame is a hidden emotion and those who are in deep chronic shame as I was and, you know, I still, I'm still dealing with it, often have no language. They can't describe what it is because the emotion is so deeply buried because we cope with shame in in um we don't even know that we're doing it it's just like an unconscious coping that we do and so my unconscious coping ranged from things like perfectionism which is uh that's an avoidant coping strategy uh, strategy absolutely i'm going to be really good at this or whatever it is and I'm, I, you know, and, and I am going to work on my voice and when it's better, I shall sing. <laughs> or, <laughs> or I will be a brilliant teacher, but I have to do a million courses before and be told that I'm brilliant by so many people and work so hard before I can announce I am that. So this, there was perfectionism in there as a, as a coping strategy uh avoidant uh, not avoidance withdrawal so so withdrawal is this is just my opinion so there's no I, I haven't read any literature yet that backs me up on this but my withdrawal 
is the thing that I've done most. And that is, I'm not going to sing. I'm going to avoid. I know I went through about 10 years of avoiding going to gigs at all costs. I I just wanted to pull back from the community uh, because I couldn't face being in that setting. It was just too painful. So, but then my avoidance would be things like, well, I just can't be bothered going on Facebook or I just can't be bothered going out. I don't have to go out. I've got kids. So I've got an excuse. So I could just keep avoiding painful situations. Yeah. And I think, withdrawing, withdrawing, sorry, withdrawing. Yeah. And I think the shame, the shame of it the, is yeah. <laughs> that there are, there are a number of voice teachers who are dealing with vocal issues that are, that are no fault of their own, whether it's, yeah. it's disease, cancers, mm-hmm. um, paresis, all of these different things. And there seems to be this idea out there that just infects us that unless you sing at this certain level, you have no business teaching. And some of these people are the best voice teachers I know. And and the world needs to have their knowledge and their gift and, and their ability to teach and they withdraw because of the shame, not just from the general public, but even amongst some in the teaching industry. And there's, there's a, I've said the word before, it's an overused word, but there's a bit of bullying going on. And there's, there's a, a bit of this, yeah. look what I can do. And if you can't do this, that this is the only, the only criteria, mm-hmm. the number one criteria is how well or how high I can sing. And if you're not meeting this criteria, everything else you bring to the table is of lesser value. Yes. And I certainly bought into that. Very much so. And it's been a very long process of, of, of taking those ideas away from myself. But you know what? I'll openly admit. I still lack trust. I, I I don't have voice lessons anymore. I don't connect with the voice teacher community in that way anyway. I do, you know, I I connect with the community, but but I don't connect that way because what happened over the course of let's say 12, 13 years of training with uh, with different teachers for me was harder to deal with. Now those and and also I I want to say every single one of those teachers I love like I just love them and they're beautiful people and there's nothing you know I can't honestly say any anything that anyone within that particular community ever said to me that that caused me to feel this pain by the time I entered that part of my life I look back now and say I was riddled with shame anyway absolutely riddled with it I yeah it's um you've said a couple of things that I actually would would love to have gone pause (laughs) (laughs) because because they were great but the thing I want to also say is that shame is an incredibly lonely space and the antithesis of shame is connection and that is one of the reasons I'm doing the work I'm doing is because I want to see us as a community more connected. And when I say connected, I mean in a compassionate and empathetic way. So the fact that you've invited me on here today, I'm so happy because it means I get to, you know, I get to be vulnerable. I get to share part, not all of my story, but I get to be vulnerable and I get to say to other people, invite other people into the conversation around how painful injury can be and also how voice shame and voice shaming (laughs) exists. And what we don't want to do is, is take the people that shame and shame them. We don't want to do that. You know, that's, that's not an objective of mine on any level. Um, I welcome conversations, 
But I think that we do need to talk about compassion more and empathy. And there's something I want to talk about, which is a bit controversial, John. Um, can I be really bold with you and have a conversation around the idea of voice objectification? So, sure. So think of this voice as instrument. Yeah. People talk about it all the time. I don't believe the voice is an instrument at all. I understand that we talk about it that way from a, a linguistic point of view. Sometimes we throw it around. But if you want to think about it in a very sort of literal sense, you can't touch a voice. You can't photograph a voice. Yeah. At least not fully. Not fully. This is right. Yeah. We 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 are nounifying something that actually when when we call the voice an instrument, I think there's a disembodiment that takes place. Now, this is just me spitballing. I, it, I almost love belittles, it almost belittles what the voice is because right. we understand the piano. Yes. It's man-made, human-made. Yeah. We understand yeah. the guitar. Yeah. We still don't understand this. This this we don't understand voice. it fully. No, no, no. So I think that within the work that I'm going to be doing, I'd really like to open up that conversation around how can we, I mean, you listen, okay. So someone breaks their guitar, right? That's really sad. That sucks. Maybe they spent a lot of money. Maybe they can't work because they've broken their guitar. They need to get another one or whatever. That is not shameful. That is not likely to bring a profound sense of deep shame. You might feel a sh uh, sorry ashamed of being clumsy or whatever, but the attachment to the guitar itself is not going to bring shame. This is our body. You know, this is our heart, our soul, our spirit. It's, I just can't sit around any longer and think about the voice as instrument. And I think that if we continue thinking that way, I'm wondering whether or not that disembodiment then permits some form of objectification, shaming. I don't know. It's just, it's just me with my noisy thoughts. <laughs> well, it's interesting because I find that I need to respect and revere the mystery that is the voice. Yeah. But I also find when I'm working with it, it can be helpful for me to disembody it in a sense that, okay, this is my voice so that, so that when I'm having problems with it, I don't feel I'm having problems with myself. It is, it is this thing over here that, that I'm controlling, that I am working on. So it is, it is this voice over here that's having the issue. It's not me having the issue. Wow. Boom. So, however, <laughs> our connection with this instrument is profound. And that's why all the different it, it, disciplines that are now starting to enter into the world of voice, including neuroscience and, and movement, and imagery, and um, even the study of, of going beyond just the muscles, but, but getting deeper into the body and the anatomy and the, and the fascia and just the, the whole yes. mind-body connection. And, and even, I mean, uh, mindfulness and yes. even the sense, you know, I, I've, I've talked about this on the podcast, but I'll do an exercise where I will just rub my, my thumb against my fingers and then just really pay attention to that. And it, if you pay enough attention and focus, it becomes a mystery as to how you're doing that. And that's yeah. something we have very direct control over. So this instrument, my gosh, it is mind blowing that we're able to match pitch. We, we don't see these muscles. We don't feel them. We don't have conscious control. So when we have shame attached to this, when this instrument, because it's the human body and the human body is ultimately going to fail us all. But when we, when we have struggles with our human body and we all have struggles and health goes up and certain aspects go down, 
when it's the voice, man, oh man, this isn't like gout, right? <laughs> or I'm having a bit of tennis elbow. No. This is like, oh my God, even if you don't sing, people yeah. who start to have vocal issues when they have dysphonia or you just see them withdraw so intensely and so deeply, it's just, yeah. it's just shattering. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And, you know, something came to me a few weeks ago when I was doing some stream of consciousness writing in my journal. And I realized that, you know, I witness it with my students. <clears throat> um, but, but I was reflecting on my own self and my own voice. And I said, I wrote it down. It was like a realization. And I wrote, Lisa, your voice is never an apology because I'd spent so many years either apologizing to other people. Oh, excuse me. Sorry. It's, you know, oh, it's just my injury or, oh, oh, uh, you know, oh, it's not behaving itself or whatever. And I witnessed, sorry, with clients as well, they come in and they, you know, maybe their voice is, is not doing what it was doing yesterday or was not doing what it was doing last week or whatever. It doesn't or, matter. Or before lunch. Or before, whatever, <laughs> you know, um, this, I, this thing that, I don't know, we just seem to do, it's, like, oh, I'm sorry, it's, it's a bit tired today or, oh, you know, and, and I encourage people to, and myself, I encourage people to practice like a, a type of radical acceptance over whatever is within that voice. I love this because we're always apologizing if it's not a hundred percent. But, but what about, um, just loving and embracing what is and you you had another story which I really loved about the piano uh Keith Garrett the Keith Garrett story where oh yes yes, the, yes yes and and I just thought this is brilliant that's exactly it like yeah he was working. stuck he was given a substandard piano yes and had and worked his way around it for a live performance that's, yes. that's I believe is still it's one it's the best selling uh instrumental piano recording yeah, yeah. of all time yeah yeah and and it it's what the defects of the instrument is what made his performance brilliant and i think the creativity that comes about through having an open mind to that to whatever is like the the as i said the the radical acceptance if if my voice is not willing to i don't know to connect you know through through my bridge let's say it's just flipping out left right and center and it just doesn't want to do what i think it should or what it did yesterday when i was approaching those notes why not just let the voice flip out for a minute why not just embrace that why not play with that why not experiment why not dance with that why not invite that into the, cre the, the creative process. I have to stop you there and say how much I love this. And I think, I think that people need to, to take that because what do we do? We have that and the first thought is, I have to fix that. And, and oh. it may not be ready to be fixed. And so then we go into resistance, we go into fighting, yeah. and it is, the, it is the, the overcompensation and the avoidance, my tremor, it wasn't the tremor that was the problem so much as my body starting to compensate for it. Yes. Right? In me going, what is wrong? And, and, and not having, not seeing the right person yeah. for it. And then just, just beginning to fight it. That caused more issues than, than the tremor itself. But Lisa, I, I definitely want to have you you back because this is this is a topic that we can that we can further further speak on. But um, please let everyone know where they can find out more about you. Ah, oh, so my website is www.epiphanyvocalstudio.com. So yeah, epiphany. Perfect name. I get yeah, well exactly. <laughs> I had a rebrand. I had a rebrand a few yeah. years ago because you know and and. We've literally, yeah, touched on this, and I'm so happy that uh, you've invited me on, and we get to share a moment together um, of, of vulnerability, right? Because 
we need to connect and 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 I welcome anyone if they want to get in touch with me about any of this and also anybody out there who may be interested in participating in the voice shame study um whether they are injured or not it doesn't matter um part of the study is focused on injured professional singers and other parts of the study are not so much so um, if there is anyone that wants to reach out, I would love to talk to you. Great. Thank you so much for joining us. Yay. Thank you. <laughs>